Welcome back, everybody, to the 11th episode of the podcast. We've got a pretty fun episode today. We're going to be continuing our NFL season preview going through the AFC West. The MLB season's really starting to get exciting. We're going to go over some storylines. We're going to give our American League All-Stars. The NBA season is just wrapped up. We're going to talk about the finals and the offseason. And then for our fun and game segment, we have a surprise that not even I know yet. So it should be interesting. As always, of course, I'm joined by Nick and Ader. If you want to say anything before we kick off. Not much to say. I'm glad to be back and got a sneaky little surprise for Rocky today. Yeah, I, I'm actually genuinely curious what this could be. But that's going to be at the end of the episode. So uh, let's not waste any more time and get started with our AFC West analysis and predictions. So we have gone through the AFC East and the AFC North up to this point. We've gone through each of those teams within those divisions. And today we're going to take a look at the AFC West. And everything here kind of starts and ends with the Kansas City Chiefs, who have won the division for a bazillion years in a row. They were the Super Bowl champions last year. They've hosted the AFC Championship every year. Mahomes has started five years in a row, which is very impressive. And there's no reason to think they're going to slow down. I think the Chiefs have done a good job of continuously adding talent while also drafting well and staying young. And I think they will be able to have sustained success over the next decade or so with Patrick Mahomes at quarterback. He's the best QB in the league. I don't think anybody's really going to argue that. They have the best tight end in the league with Travis Kelsey. They have Chris Jones, who I thought should have won Defensive Player of the Year last year. I mean, those are three of the five to ten best overall players in the league on one team. There are still some questions, though. I'm curious to see how the offensive line performs. They lost Orlando Brown, so they did pay Jawan Taylor a ton of money. But, I mean, what's going to happen with left tackle? They recently signed Donovan Smith. Maybe he's going to start there. The interior line's really good, though, with Joe Tooney, Creed Humphrey, and Trey Smith. But the tackles could be interesting. The wide receiver position with this team has really been in question since Tyreek Hill left. Now they don't have Juju Smith-Schuster anymore. So who's really going to be the number one? I don't think Kadarius Toney or Sky Moore really had that in their skill set. They're more of, like, gadgety slot guys. Marquez Valdez scantling's cool. Rishi Rice is interesting. It's nice having Travis Kelsey, who is the number one target in the passing game, but I'm curious to see if any of these receivers step up. I'm curious to see if Isaiah Pacheco has another good season. I'm sometimes a little bit weary of late round running backs. It seems like they don't always progress, but I think Isaiah Pacheco could be one to break the trend. I think he is that level of player. And then defensively, they do have a lot of really good players. Nick Bolton is super underrated. Legereus Sneed is also very underrated. I want to see if Trent McDuffie and George Karloftis can take a leap in year two. They've got a lot of young guys, really specifically in that secondary. They had a bunch of rookies back there last year and still won the Super Bowl. So if all those guys, particularly McDuffie and Brian Cook, can take a leap in year two, the defense could be better than it was last year. And with Mahomes and Kelsey on offense, that should automatically be one of the better units in the league. Yeah, like you said, this Chiefs roster, they're going to be the favorite for the Super Bowl, with that's without a doubt. But when you look at the roster, besides the, the big names, Mahomes, Kelsey, Chris Jones, and I'd throw Creed Humphrey in there too, besides those four guys, they don't have a lot of really star power. The best receiver is either Katarius Tony or Marquise Vado Scanley, who are fine players. And I know the Chiefs believe uh, Tony could be a future number one, but he hasn't been able to take that step up just yet. But... Having Mahomes as your QB definitely helps. And Pacheco was solid last year. I know he kind of bullied the Eagles' run defense uh, in the Super Bowl. And I think he'll be able to take a step up. But even that defense, there's not a lot of star power. They got Justin Reed, McDuffie, LeJarius Sneed. They're all really young, really good players who look like they shouldn't be as good of a defense as they are. And yet they're consistently top 15, pushing top 10 defense. And the only real like superstar name is... Chris Jones but that entire unit just plays really well really efficiently and they know how to get the job done and they've been able to the past five years since the home has been there and obviously the wide receiver position is going to look at you have Kelsey who's going to be him and at the time of recording this Hopkins is not signed anywhere so there is always the chance that DeAndre Hopkins signs with the Chiefs and they become a juggernaut but even if Hopkins signs somewhere else I would not be scared of having guys like Tony, Sky Moore, and MVS as your big three receivers. Sky Moore looks like a really nice slot receiver. 
MVS can be that just deep running guy for Mahomes just to chuck it deep when he feels like it. And then Tony can kind of be the guy to kind of glue everyone else together, fill in where everyone else isn't. And when you have a guy like Mahomes, you can settle for lesser receivers. You kind of saw that toward the twilight years with Brady and the Patriots. But speaking of that twilight years with the Patriots, they weren't drafting efficiently towards those last few years. Brady was in New England. You got Nikhil Harry, which was a bust. The running backs weren't panning out. They couldn't get Brady any weapons, and he ended up leaving because the roster was bad. But right here in, in Kansas City, they've been drafting efficiently. Pacheco looks great. Kelsey is really good. They got a top three center. Trey Smith looks really good. Chris Jones, Willie Gay, Nick Bolton, Sneed, McDuffie. Everyone looks really good on this roster. And if they continue to draft how they've been drafting, getting those good trades like Kadarius Tony, this roster is going to be formidable for decades. So if any team in the AFC West can realistically dethrone the Chiefs really within the next three years, I would say that's the Los Angeles Chargers. And I think a lot of people would agree that right now they are comfortably the second best team in the division. The Chargers made the playoffs last year. They were probably the best wildcard team in the AFC. They should have won their first round game and then they hilariously blew it. So I think the narrative of Justin Herbert this offseason has been pretty interesting because it seems like there's a lot of people who feel like Justin Herbert doesn't really get any blame for the playoff loss or really anything that ever goes wrong with the Chargers. And it seems like some people kind of think that Justin Herbert gets portrayed as this like perfect quarterback when he's not. And then there's the other side of the spectrum where people think that Justin Herbert's really underrated and he doesn't get enough credit. I would say I'm kind of in the middle there. If I were to lean one way, I do feel like he kind of does deserve more credit. I mean, he's really, really good, and he has been phenomenal ever since he stepped on the field as a rookie. There's a legit argument that he is a top five quarterback in the league, and if you do have him in your top five, I'm not really going to argue against it. The Chargers have an intriguing group of weapons. It seems like Austin Eckler is going to play. There were rumors that he wanted out, largely because of contract stuff, but it seems like he's going to play this year. The receiving core I'm interested in, they drafted Quentin Johnston in the first round. I wasn't as high on him as others, but I do think he is an intriguing prospect. Him and Mike Williams on the outside should be pretty good. And then Keenan Allen in the slot. He did grade out pretty well last year. He's the ninth receiver per PFF, but it does seem like he is starting to get a little bit older, which is understandable. Somebody in his 30s with past injury issues. But I still think Keenan Allen can be a productive player. He doesn't need to win with athleticism or quickness. He wins with his smarts and his route running, which can take him into his 30s. The offensive line was an issue early in Herbert's career, but now it's started to turn into a strength, at least on paper. Rashawn Slater is going to be back. That's a big deal. Corey Lindsley is one of the better centers in the league. Zion Johnson, I think, could take a leap in year two. So their offense should have no problem scoring the ball. I do have some questions on defense, though. Khalil Mack is starting to show signs of age. He is still a good player, though. But will him and Joey Bosa be a top five edge rushing duo in the league? I'm not really convinced they can. The linebacking core, they added Eric Kendricks. But can this be the year that Kenneth Murray takes a leap? Because it's kind of now or never with him. Uh, the secondary, there are some questions. Can JC Jackson rebound after he played pretty terribly last season before getting injured? Can Asante Samuel Jr. take a leap in year three? How's the other safety position along with Derwin James going to be? So there are some holes on this defense, and I think that could kind of be this team's kryptonite. But on paper, this is still a playoff team as long as Justin Herbert plays at a top 5 to 10 level, which he certainly should. Yeah, this is easily the second best team in this division, and we'll go over the, the other two in a bit. But just kind of looking at the Chargers, it, it like, you, like the Chiefs, it's going to revolve around the quarterback. It's going to revolve around Justin Herbert. Can he get the job done? I think the big thing revolving the Chiefs, or not, I'm sorry, the Chiefs, the Chargers, is the revolving door at offensive coordinator. And they finally got a guy who seems like he can stick around. And with Kellen Moore, seeing him in the Cowboys for a while, he was the guy that kind of helped out Dak Prescott kind of become one of the better QBs in the league. He throws a lot of trick plays in there that don't really need to be there. The classic Kellen Moore, just dumb, stupid stuff. But I think he's going to be a lot more efficient than Joe Lombardi was last year. When you have a guy as talented as Justin Herbert, and he's throwing sub-30 touchdowns with Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, and Austin Eckler, I know there was a lot of injuries last year, especially to Keenan Allen. 
But still, you need at least like 30 touchdowns for Herbert. And when you are just throwing checkdowns with a guy who has a top five arm in the league, it, it's ridiculous. So getting a guy like Quinn Johnson for the offense to help him out, especially if like Keenan Allen and Michael Williams get hurt, you get the, you still have Austin Eckler on the roster who can help out. Joe Everett looks like a decent tight end who actually played pretty solid last year. You get Rashawn Slater back, who was hurt pretty much the entire season last year. Zion Johnson looks like he's going to be good. Corey Lindsley's top five center. So the entire left side of the line is going to be really good. And then the right side is, is solid enough to where you don't need to worry about it right now. And then the defense, like you said, that's going to be the big question. I think what really helps out is you get a solid veteran linebacker in Eric Hendricks to either solidify the middle of the defense and also maybe fix Kenneth Murray and help him out to not be really bad. Um, but the other big thing is getting J.C. Jackson back. He was hurt a lot last year. And when he was on the field, he was not that good. He's a great player, but if he can rebound from injury, kind of get back to what he was in that last season in New England, that's what the Chargers really need. You have Asante Samuel Jr., who played really good in that game against the Jags. He had, what, three interceptions, four? He had a lot. He had three, yeah. But... Yeah, but he has the raw talent to be a top 15 corner in the league. But every now and then, you'll see him get burnt good once, twice in a game. And it's it's a little upsetting. But if you get Jason Jackson back, Santi Samuel kind of reforms what he can do. Derwin James is the top two center or safety in the league. And find that guy next to Derwin. Right now, I think they have Alahai Gilman as JT Woods. As their second safety, they're probably going to go try and sign someone else. There's still a few out there in free agency they can go get. But it's going to revolve around this defense and see if Bosa and Kalumak can be the, the guys. If Kenneth Murray can take the step up. If J.C. Jackson and Samuel can kind of be that top 10 corner duo that they can be. But it's really going to be to see if Callum Moore can get Justin Herbert to show that he has that top five talent that we all know he has. The team who finished in third place in this division last year was the Las Vegas Raiders. They only won six games last year. They do have quite a bit of high-end talent, but I am concerned that this team could finish at the bottom of the division again. Josh McDaniels has proven that he's not really an NFL caliber coach, and there's no reason I think that's going to change this year. And I do have a lot of questions about the quarterback position with Jimmy Garoppolo. You know what you're going to get with Jimmy, but I don't think that's really the case this year because of some of the medical question marks that have come out about him pretty recently. So if Jimmy's unable to play, the Raiders are kind of screwed unless they can convince their potential new minority owner, Tom Brady, to come out of retirement. Their other backups are Aiden O'Connell, Brian Hoyer, and Chase Garber. So I guess Brian Hoyer would probably start if something happens to Jimmy, which even if he is cleared to play by week one, he's been injury prone in the past. It very well could happen. Maybe they give Aiden O'Connell a shot who they drafted in day three last year out of Purdue. But whoever plays a quarterback is going to have some very good skill position players. And that starts with the rushing champ last year, Josh Jacobs. And there are some questions about him too. It's unclear with his contract status if he's going to play. It seems like he wants a new deal and the Raiders aren't budging, which is kind of understandable. Obviously, he plays running back. He's got a lot of tread on the tires as a four-year full-time starter. But Josh Jacobs seems pretty adamant about getting that new deal and being able to sign a long-term deal for some of these other running backs who have been unable to. At wide receiver, again, Devontae Adams, arguably the best player at the position in the league. And they've got some pretty good players behind him. Jacoby Myers is a decent starter. Hunter Renfro struggled last year, but he is a good player. Austin Hooper at tight end is fine. The offensive line, though, certainly not great, minus Colton Miller at left tackle. So the quarterback position is a question mark. The running back position is a question mark, assuming the contract status with Jacobs doesn't get fixed. And the offensive line is pretty bad. And that was the least of the Raiders' worries last year because their defense was pretty atrocious. They do have some very good players here. Max Crosby, of course, one of the best pass rushers in the league. They drafted Tyree Wilson, who should be a good player. They still have Chandler Jones, who is showing signs of aging, but still a decent enough player. But other than that, it, it's really not good. They don't have a lot in the middle. Their linebacking core, maybe Divine Diablo takes a step up, but like it's really not great. The corners, again, not great at all. Their current projected starters are Duke Shelley and David Long. At safety, they have some intriguing players. Uh, maybe Marcus Epps 
can be productive here. Maybe Trayvon Merrick takes a step. Nate Hobbs in the slot is fine at corner, but it is a really bad defense to go along with the questions on offense. And I think there's a chance this team could end up being the worst in the AFC, especially if Jimmy Garoppolo does not play. Yeah, the, the biggest question mark, just like the past two teams, has been is going to be the QB. Going from Derek Carr, who adding Devontae Adams, you think would have been played a lot better and played worse enough to get benched and get replaced by a backup that I don't even remember. What, what, Adrian McCarron? Is that who it was? I don't know at this point. But Jimmy G is probably a downgrade. Maybe he'd be more consistent, but he has less of a ceiling than Derek Carr. And if he's not even going to play, then... Who knows what the Raiders are going to get after signing the three-year deal? Maybe they go out and just try and tank for CJ or Caleb to CJ. I wish um, you get Caleb, you get Drake May, whoever you want to go get. That's probably what the Raiders are kind of going into this year. If you can get Jacobs on a new contract, that'd be nice. But I have a feeling that he does, if he wants a contract, and I don't think he wants it with the Raiders. I think he wants to get out of there. I think Devontae Adams. They signed him to a new deal. They traded for him. He might want out. He might want to get out of there and just... He sees it's going down, but I don't know what he wants to do. He loves to be a Raider, but now his best friend is gone. So who knows at this point if he's going to stay there or not. And then Jacob Myers, solid three guy. Hunter Renfro, nice slot guy. But pairing with Devon Adams is going to be really nice for Jimmy G, assuming he plays. And the offensive line, big question mark. Colton Miller is solid, but the rest of the line... Not very good. Probably the weakest part of the entire offense last year, along with Derek Carr. But that defense is something real bad. And besides Max Crosby, that's that's about all they got. The interior defensive line is Jerry Tillery and Bilal Nichols. You know who they are, and you know they're not very good. They're going to be run, ran all over. You have one good pass rusher because Chandler Jones was not very good last year. Maybe Divine Diablo takes a step up. Maybe, who knows? Nate Hobbs is a solid corner, but he's not number one. He's a fine slot guy. You want Duke Shelley covering Tyreek Hill, covering uh, Travis Kelsey. Who do, who do, who's going to cover Travis Kelsey? No one. That's just 400 yards that Travis Kelsey's getting in two games. The Raiders, I don't think, are going to go very far. McDaniels is a bottom three head coach in the league. I am. I said in the AFC North video, I am a Steelers hater. I am a Raiders hater. I am a Kyler Murray hater. Josh McDaniels is not a good coach. There is a reason that Derek Carr took a step down when he got Devontae Adams. And that's because the offensive line and Josh McDaniels. And this team will not go very far. I I kind of want them to do good to stop me and make me stop hating. But you downgrade at QB. The defense looks awful. And your best two players, you have Devontae Adams, who probably wants out. Max Crosby, who got a new deal... But I wish he'd leave so that he can go win at something. Because there's not gonna be there's not gonna be a lot of winning in Vegas. And then the final team we have in the division is Broncos Country. Let's ride. The Denver Broncos are the one team who I think could really surprise people here. Obviously, they hired Sean Payton, and what they're trying to do is fix Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson obviously played pretty terribly last year. I don't need to tell you guys that because you all know that. Can Sean Payton fix Russell Wilson? I think there's a chance that he can. Russell Wilson's been a very good quarterback throughout the duration of his entire career. He should have, honestly, an MVP or two at this point. It's kind of the travesty that he's never gotten a vote, let alone an award. Even though Russ is a cornball, he is a talented player. And while he was awful last year, I think there is a chance that Russell Wilson could play a lot better. If he does, this team could be a playoff team. I'm curious to see how the run game is. Javante Williams is coming off a bad knee injury, so we'll see when he's ready during the season. They signed Shabajay P. Ryan, who is honestly a pretty underrated player. I think he can manage the load as the main running back until Javante Williams comes back. They don't really have a whole lot behind him, though. Maybe a guy like Tyler Beatty is productive. I don't know. Uh, wide receiver, they do have some good players. Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy in particular. Both guys have been dangled in trade rumors throughout the offseason. I think both of those guys are honestly pretty underrated, especially Jerry Judy. I don't think Judy gets enough credit as honestly a 
pretty good player. I think it's more so because he was drafted ahead of better receivers like Jefferson, CeeDee Lamb, T. Higgins, and Brandon Ayuk. But Jerry Judy is really good, and so is Cortland Sutton. K.J. Hamler is fine. Tim Patrick's going to be back from injury. Greg Dolchich can take a leap in year two. So if everybody can stay healthy within this skill position group, which is a big ask, a lot of these guys have had trouble with that, then it could be one of the better overall offensive groups in the league. Their offensive line is, is fine. Quinn Miners is developing into a solid player. Hopefully someone like Lloyd Cushenberry can take a leap. They've got a pretty good tackle duo with Garrett Bowles and Mike McGlinchey. Neither of those guys are going to wow you, but they're both fine. And then the defense was the strength of the team last year. The defense honestly wasn't even half bad. We'll see if Randy Gregory can perform better. He didn't play a ton last year because of an injury, I believe. So it'll be interesting to see how he's able to do. They did sign him to a lot of money. They gave Zach Allen a pretty big contract. He's a talented player. And then, obviously, they've got a good secondary. Patrick Sertan is one of the best corners in the league. Damari Mathis, the other projected outside starting corner, is an intriguing young player who I think could take a leap. Justin Simmons is obviously a very good safety. And then even Kareem Jackson, who is getting older, is still highly productive. So overall, I think the defense should be pretty good. And if the offense can play well, and if Russell Wilson can look better than he did last year, I think there is a world where this team slips into the playoffs, possibly as the second or third place team in the division. Yeah, we, we've said it the past three teams, again, with the Broncos, it's going to be, can Russell Wilson at least become like an average quarterback? If he plays average, almost like Jimmy G with the Niners, or even kind of like Herbert last year, almost, if he can do just the, the bare average, the bare minimum, this team could be a 7-6 seed maybe. It It's going to be if Wilson can be healthy, is Javante Williams going to be able to take that step back from injury? And if not, is Samaje Piran going to be good enough to be a number one running back in this league? Because he's never really been number one. He's been the number two behind Joe Mixon for the past few years. You see Jerry Judy, Corton Sutton, Tim Patrick coming back from a big injury last year. He was looking really nice until that injury. Is Judy and Sutton going to be on the team by the time we get to the training camp, by the time we get to week one? Are we going to have, is the court going to be in session? Judge Judy residing? Who Are are they both going to be there still? That is the question. Um, with how many trade rumors that have been going around, I could see one of them getting traded. Don't be the Giants. Please don't. They don't need them. But Greg Dolchers looks like a good young tight end. The O-line looks decent. He signed Mike McGlinchey to a big contract that should definitely help out. Ben Power signed with him as well at left guard. So helping out Russell Wilson, getting him a better O-line. Maybe the best O-line he's seen because Seattle never gave him an O-line. But he has the weapons. He has the O-line. Now he has Sean Payton to help him out. Can Sean Payton fix Russell Wilson? That is going to be one of the bigger storylines, not just for this team, but for probably any team in the NFL. Can Russell Wilson take that step with Sean Payton? And then the defense, Frank Clark signs a, a short deal. Zach Allen signed a big deal. Aaron Browning looks like a young uh, linebacker coming up. Uh, Randy Gregory had a lot of injuries last year. Can he take a step up? Drew Sanders, a guy that was a lot of, a lot of people were hyping up Drew Sanders last year as a rookie. And now he's going to be sitting there behind Singleton and Josie Jewell. Is he going to get a chance to start? Is he going to be able to show off what he can do? And that secondary, you have Pastor Tan and Justin Simmons, top five at their position. Are they going to be able to hanker, hanker down that secondary? This Stevens is really good last year, top 10 probably. And it's going to be a big question of can they contain it? Can they continue to do what they were doing last year? There was a few games like that Rams game on Nickelodeon, and they let up so many points. It's because Russell Wilson couldn't stay on the damn field. They couldn't. The defense had to keep getting back on the field every damn four plays. If now they have time to rest a bit, assuming Russ plays fine, it's going to be the question, can the defense be what at least what they were doing last year? Can Russ play average? If he could do that, and you told me they were a 7-6 seed, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, before we reveal our orders, another player who I forgot to mention, one of my favorite players in the draft, Marvin Mims, a wide receiver. I think he could get a lot of snaps this year, especially if some guys get injured. But as for my order, I'm going to go kind of chalky here. Chiefs, Chargers, Broncos, Raiders. I want to be creative, but I think that's going to be the order. I think if any of those switch around, maybe the Raiders perform better than expected. Maybe the Broncos pass the Chargers. 
I do have a hard time thinking the Chiefs don't win the division, but a couple injuries happen, and you never know. The complexity of the division could change. Yeah, barring any kind of injuries, I think that's probably going to how it plays out. With Russ assumingly playing better, Jimmy G being a downgrade, it's, it's probably most likely going to be Chiefs, Chargers, Broncos, Raiders. I don't really see any logical way it becomes anything different besides any sort of injuries. Okay, so with that, we will now shift our attention to the MLB season. We've got a lot of interesting topics to talk about there, so let's dive on into it. There have been a lot of interesting storylines here in this MLB season, and it's been a pretty fun year so far. One of my favorites was really last night with the Oakland A's reverse boycott. It was really cool to see the A's have a packed house. They ended up winning their seventh game in a row, beating the Tampa Bay Rays, who of course had the best record in baseball. And I think it kind of goes to show, obviously the fans were never the problem. I think a lot of people can realize that. But I feel like over the years, the Oakland A's have been a pretty prominent organization. I mean, you have teams like the Royals, the Marlins, the Rockies, who are usually really bad. And that's largely because their organizations are run very poorly. But I don't really view the Oakland Athletics in that sense, other than the past couple of years. The A's are usually good teams. Historically, they've been very successful over the 70s, 80s, and 90s. In the early 2010s, they were a playoff team with guys like Coco Crisp and Josh Donaldson and others. And even just recently, the Matt Olson, Matt Chapman teams, those were good squads. And then everything has just kind of fallen apart over the last three or so years. The Oakland A's are historically been one of the better organizations in the league. So I feel like it's really sad to see such a fast decline rather than a team like the Rockies, who are always bad and always shooting themselves in the foot. But with the A's, it just happened so quickly. So I'm really hoping they stay in Oakland. I think those fans really deserve it. But Oakland's already lost two teams within the last few years. It feels like that city as a whole is just in the decline. So I kind of get it in the perspective of John Fisher and the ownership to want to get out of there. But it does suck because the A's are historically a good team. And I think that place is absolutely a baseball town when that team is good. And right now, I think it's pretty fair to say they are not good minus the past week or so. Yeah, Oakland in general is one of the better sports cities. I really love their fans, especially after this reverse boycott. Boycott. They pulled up to almost 28,000 fans in attendance. And in the middle of the fifth inning after the first out, they were chanting, sell the team so loud that their pitcher thought that their pitch com broke. He could not hear anything. And they had to take a timeout and pause the game for a minute to figure it out because the fans were so loud. And this was evident to pretty much any baseball fan that the ace fans are not the problem. It is easily the ownership that is messing it up. And it's all, it all comes down to money after seeing what the Raiders have done since moving to Vegas, what um, the Warriors have done since moving. They see what it can happen. And I think it's either, I think they just want to do stadium and they want it in Vegas. They don't want to do it in Oakland. They've seen how many teams have moved from Oakland. They want to go to Vegas. It's the new nice shiny spot to go to, especially after the Vegas Knights just won uh, and a Stanley Cup just the other night. They win a championship. The Raiders at least kind of have some promise and they want to kind of go do the same. And I think it's not going to happen for a bit, but they, they want to get to Vegas. They want to go have some fun. And the athletics, there's not a lot of players that are good. Uh, there's probably about two that I can think of that are good. None of the pitching is good. Pitching's awful. But it's really weird just seeing because the A's are always kind of one of those better teams, like you said, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, even the 2010s for a good bit. They were really good. This past five years, they've just been just plummeting down. And it's not like Miami, it's not like the Royals where the fans just don't really care. The fans are passionate. The fans love this team. They just want a good team to root for. It's hard to root for a team that's this bad. I feel so bad for Oakland. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what happened, but there's another step closer to moving to Vegas. And I feel really bad for all Oakland fans, whether it's baseball, NFL, NBA, whatever. But at least you had the Vegas Knights. But now nope, they're in Vegas. Never mind. So while the A's have been talked about a lot this year for being really bad, I feel like there have been some teams who have been really good who haven't been given enough credit. 
I think people don't realize how good the Texas Rangers are, but man, they are good. Their offense might be the best in baseball. As a team, they're hitting 273 with a team OPS just under 800, and they've got a lot of guys playing really well. Marcus Semien, Warwick Three, Josh Young, the probably clear rookie of the year favorite. There have been a lot of really good rookies in the AL, but Josh Young's been phenomenal. Adolis Garcia, stud. Jonah Heim, stud. Corey Seager, when he's been healthy, he's been a stud. The pitching is a little bit of a concern, especially with the Jacob deGrom injury news. He will not be returning this year, but Nathan Eovaldi has pitched like an ace for them. He's been really, really good. So I think pitching could be this team's downfall, but they do have some guys who are pitching really well, and the offense is phenomenal. Another team who's been really fun recently is the Cincinnati Reds. They've got a super bright future. They just called up Ellie De La Cruz last week. He is as awesome as expected. I think he's going to be the next foreign superstar in baseball. We've seen a lot of these young guys really take over the game, like Acuna, Tatis, obviously Shohei Otani, Vlad Guerrero Jr., last year Julio Rodriguez. I think Ellie is next on the list. And they've got a bunch of other really good young players. They've got a phenomenal farm system. Christian Encarnacion, Strand, and AAA is raking. When are they going to call him up? Hopefully soon. And they've got a good, fun group of pitchers. Hunter Green and Nick Lodolo should be a really good duo going forward. So the Cincinnati Reds, who aren't playing too bad, 33 and 35, should be a team to watch over these next few years. As long as their ownership actually gives a damn, which with them is a lot easier said than done. But if they do care, then this team could be one of the better teams over the next five to ten years with the current core of young guys that they have. Yeah, both of those teams look really nice. The Rangers probably had the best offense in the league right now, right there with the Rays. And even after the ground got hurt, a lot of their pitchers are doing really well. And it's hard to shy away from them. They're, what, second best record, third best record right now in the American League? Yep, third best right behind the Orioles. They're a good few games ahead of the Angels and the Astros. Mariners haven't been all that good this year, and A's aren't doing anything. So they got a good, clear shot to go win that division. And even if they don't, as long as they keep doing what they're doing, they should easily get one of those wild card spots at the bare minimum. And then the Reds, they're in the NL Central. They will always have a fighting chance to win that division. I don't think it's going to happen this year, but if you tell me next year they go out, win that division, because the Brewers suck, the Pirates suck, the Cardinals are too old, I wouldn't blame you. They have one of the best young rosters in the league. They look like they could be the next Diamondbacks, the next Orioles, and I would not be shocked. And if this ownership sees what the uh, Bengals are doing in Cincinnati, then why not try it with the Reds? And then the third team that's kind of surprising me myself is the Miami Marlins. They are over over 500. They're only four games back behind the Braves. They've been playing really well. Uh, the hitters have been doing really well. Jazz, you would think, is doing really good. He's been fine. He's not too bad. But a lot of those hitters, Avisel Garcia, um, Nick Fortes, a lot of those guys are playing a lot better than people would think. The pitchers are doing great. Yuri Perez has been called up. He's been doing good. And even with Sandy Alcantara having, last I looked, over a 5 ERA, they've been still winning games. They've been going out, fighting for this division. They have the Braves in the division, so they're not going to win the division. But with how bad the Padres have been doing, the Phillies haven't been doing, doing good, the Mets are the Mets, they could sneak in to maybe a six seed. You get the Dodgers in the five seed if the Diamondbacks win. You get maybe maybe the Padres pick it up, get, get the fifth seed. The Marlins will be right there to grab that six seed. They, they keep doing what they're doing. They be on track to go get a six seed and make the playoffs again. So now we're going to be going through our American League All-Star picks. And then in the next episode, we're going to do the same thing with the National League. So how we formatted this, we have a starter at each position. We have a backup at each position. That includes three starting outfielders and three backup outfielders. Five starters and one reliever. And just like the real All-Star game, we have to pick at least one player from every team. Each squad is going to be represented, even the A's, even the Royals, even the Tigers. So I'm going to start with my infield at first base, I have Yandy Diaz as the starter. He has been fantastic this year with the Rays. And then the backup will be the lone representative of the Oakland Athletics, Ryan Noda, who hasn't really been talked about a lot because most of the A's dialogue is negative, but Ryan Noda's been a good player. 
Second base, it's the starter. I have Marcus Semien with the Rangers, and the bench player is going to be Jose Altuve. At third base, we're going to start Jose Ramirez, and we're going to have Josh Young, the rookie, come off the bench. There were some other guys I thought about. Rafael Devers, in specific, has been very good with Boston. And then at shortstop, I have Bo Bichette as the starter, and my backup is Wander Franco. I thought about Corey Seager, but I feel like he hasn't really played enough. Maybe if Corey Seager was in the National League, I'd give him the odd, because there have been, like, no really good National League shortstops. But in the AL, I think Bo and Wander Franco have been too good to not give those spots to. Yeah, a lot of it is going to be similar, because looking at stats, you see who's in the lead. Uh, but for me, I am going to have Yanni Diaz starting at the first base. Uh, and, and instead of the A's, I'm going to have the lone Royals uh, spot. It's going to be Vinny, Pasquatch, Pasquantino. Uh, I almost had Ryan Nota there, but there's another A's hitter that I think is deserving. And I, I needed someone to be on the Royals because they have no good pitching, and it, it's about it. Uh, second base, Chalk, same thing as you. Mark Simeon starting. Altuve is the backup. Tuve hasn't played all that much, but he's been good when he's on the field. At third, we have J Ram starting. I thought about Josh Jung. I thought about Devers. Love Devers. I ended up going Matt Chapman, guy who's been a little resurging offensively and always a gold glove, platinum glove type of defender. And then at shortstop, I went with Corey Seager. He hasn't played all that much, obviously, but he has been fantastic he has a over 1000 ops and while he has only played in 35 games so far i think it is still deserving because he is on fire and it's deserving and the backup is gonna be boba Shett. he has been on fire uh it felt weird leaving wander franco out but like you said the national league does not have a lot of good shortstops right now uh, but those three guys are going to be really good for the American League. My three starting outfielders at first, we've got Aaron Judge, who's been just as good as he was last year. Him and Shohei Otani are going to have another MVP race for the ages. Jordan Alvarez will be my second spot. He just continues to rake. That's all he does. And then my third starter, there are a few good candidates here, but I'm going to give it to Randy Rosarena with the Tampa Bay Rays. And then my three backup outfielders, we have the lone Boston representative, Masataka Yoshida, along with Mike Trout, and then Adolis Garcia with the Rangers. Behind the plate, my starter is going to be Adley Rutschman with the Baltimore Orioles. I think he is absolutely good enough to be an all-star. He's earned this opportunity. And then the backup will be the lone Royals representative, Salvador Perez. And while he is getting older, he hasn't really lost much of the step offensively. As for the designated hitter, Shohei Otani, for me, will be the starter. I thought about putting him in as a pitcher, too, but a lot of the pitchers I have are their only team's representatives, so I couldn't. And then the other DH will be the lone representative for the Chicago White Sox with Jake Berger, who's been one of their better offensive players this year, and the White Sox don't have many other good candidates. Yeah, for the outfield, it's kind of a bit of a chalk in those three starters. You're Don Alvarez in left field, you got Randy Rosarain in center, and you have Aaron Judge in right field. Those three look like potential MVP candidates. Between those three, Shohei, they all look fantastic. For the backups, I had the lone Boston representative and Masataka Yoshida. <laughs> Love that man. Left field, I have my lone White Sox representative and Luis, Luis Robert. He has been really good. I thought about Jake Berger, but I will get to DH in a minute. And then we have Mike Trout, of course. It's Mike Trout. Uh, behind the dish, I almost went Adley Rushman, but as the starter, I have Jonah Heim. He has been ridiculously good. He's been uh, hitting better than Adley. His defense is up to snuff. And as a part of the best offense in the baseball, give him the start. And then you got Adley Rush from right there, backing him up. DH spot, got to be Shio Otani. No reason to go anywhere else. And backing him up is my lone age representative, Brent Rucker. Him and Ryan Noda have been really, pretty good, actually, for the A's. Uh, if they got traded the deadline for some decent prospects, I would not be shocked. But maybe if management cared, they could build around them instead and go win games, but they would never do that. As for the pitchers, the starting pitcher for the American League will be Shane McClanahan for a second straight year. He has been arguably even better than he was last year, which is really impressive. I mentioned Nathan Eovaldi earlier. He's going to get my second spot with the Rangers. And then my other three starting pitchers are the lone representatives for their teams. I wanted to put guys like Shohei Otani, Garrett Cole, and Framber Valdez 
but each team needs a rep. So we're going to go with Eduardo Rodriguez with the Detroit Tigers. He's been out for a little bit, but he is still certainly good enough to make the all-star team. Luis Castillo with the Seattle Mariners. Could have gone with him or George Kirby, but I think Castillo's been a little bit better. And then your guy, Joe Ryan's going to get my last spot. He's been phenomenal this year with Minnesota. And then my lone reliever will be Yannier Cano with the Baltimore Orioles. He is obviously coming out of nowhere and been a total stud for them. So he's going to be my American League reliever. For the pitchers, I'm right there with you. I have Shane McClanahan making his second start in, this, in the same amount of years. He's been ridiculous for the Rays. Uh, not much else to say. And then right after that, I have the Tigers, Twins, and the Mariners representative. We have Eduardo Rodriguez, Luis Castillo, and I have Sonny Gray in there as well. And I had to put my guy in. I had to put Joe Ryan in there. There were so many other guys I could have put in there. Garrett Cole, Robert Valdez. There's five other guys, maybe Shohei, five other guys I can't think name of right now, but I wanted to go throw someone else in there that I thought only I would have put in there, but we got Joe Ryan in there. And then as a reliever, I was hoping you would do someone else, but Gunnar Cano looks fantastic. He's better than Felix Bautista. He looks like the best reliever in baseball right now. And it's shocking. Yeah, out of nowhere, this Orioles bullpen just looks ridiculous. So those are our all-star selections for the American League. Pretty similar, but we do have some differences. A lot of good candidates. It should be a fun race. And then next time around, we will be going through our National League All-Stars as well. So let's now shift to the NBA. We're going to quickly recap the finals and talk about the offseason and the draft. The NBA Finals has concluded, and as I'm pretty sure both of us predicted correctly, not only did the Denver Nuggets win, but they ended up winning in five games. I think the Miami Heat deserve a lot of credit. Their roster really is not the best, but Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo as well, and obviously Coach Spo were able to lead them to a finals appearance, the first eight seed to make the finals, I think since one of those Knicks teams in the late 90s. Eight teams making it out of the first round is pretty much unheard of, let alone making it all the way to the finals. But Denver's too good. I think Denver would have beaten whoever they would have played against in the East. If not Miami, I think they could have beaten whoever they would have played against in the West. The Nuggets went 16-4 and four in the playoffs. They only had one series go longer than five games. That was Phoenix in the second round. They never had an elimination game where their backs were against the wall. The Denver Nuggets were the best team in the league this year. They absolutely deserve this. Nikola Jokic is the best player in the world, and I will not let anybody tell me otherwise. He is the man, and he showed it through the entire playoffs, and they've done a really good job of building the roster around Joker. Jamal Murray is a legit number two option. He's a B-plus player in the regular season, but he is an A-level player in the playoffs. And this is how he was in the bubble. And now that he's fully healthy again off the ACL injury, he looks better than he was before he got hurt. Michael Porter Jr., Aaron Gordon, Bruce Brown, KCP, all guys who are able to step into their role. And I also got to shout out my boy, Christian Brown, Rock Chalk, the fifth player in basketball history to win an NCAA National Championship and then the NBA Finals the following year. And he was an impactful rotation player for them. So shout out to CB. Yeah, like you said, both me me and you both had the Nuggets in five. I tried to predict the exact amount of games. I thought he would win game one and it would be chalk from there. I was close. They won game two. I was goddamn close. But regardless, I think after, honestly, after the first round of the playoffs, I think we all saw the Bucks fall. The Celtics struggled a little bit against the Hawks. And the Suns struggled a bit. And we all kind of looked at the Nuggets kind of dominate whoever they played. I don't even remember at this point. But they were dominant. And we all kind of thought, you know, they they kind of coasted the last bit of the year. But they look hot. Jamal Murray looks fantastic. Jokic looks like the best player in ever. He probably, maybe best offensive center. He can pass, he can shoot, he can score, he can dominate. He can do whatever you need him to do. He's going to be there. It, it was chalk. That's what it was. We all thought, okay, let's past few years. It hasn't been the one seed. It hasn't been the Nuggets. They've been really good, but they just kind of haven't been doing, getting it done in the playoffs. But this year, Jokic, his little young 15-year-old fat boy self, grew up, came man. And he kicks some goddamn ass, man. I it's not much. It's hard to react to these playoffs because going into this finals, 
everyone kind of looked at it and thought it it's going to be the nuggets like it would have been cool to see the heat win it'd be it'd be fun to get a nice storyline jimmy gets a ring bam gets a ring but it's not much to say jokic finally gets his ring which is well deserved jamal murray gets a ring after the incredible storyline comeback injury that he's had but it's it's going to be hard it's hard to beat the nuggets and i do want to say people thought this is a boring finals we might all thought the nuggets were going to win but this is the mo- the most watched finals in the past 5 years which after the past few finals the the bucks finals uh, i think the raptors finals is included in that this is the most watched finals in the past 5 years you're calling it boring it's not boring jokic is amazing to watch and jamal murray fantastic i love him So let's now take a look at the off season, and we're gonna start with an interesting question here. Do we think the big three slash super team era in the NBA is dead? And I would say probably, kind of, no, sort of. I still think teams are gonna be able to form super teams. The Suns might make another move to add another star with KD or Devin Booker. Maybe that's James Harden. Maybe that's Bradley Beal. Who knows? The Lakers are going to look to add another star, Kyrie Irving as well possibly in the mix. So I think teams are not only still going to try to make super teams, but I think you're going to have some successful ones if you can round out the roster with good depth. Look at the Lakers this year. No, obviously they weren't a super team, but they had a very productive deadline. They didn't give up a whole lot. They added a bunch of good depth pieces and as the seventh seed they made it to the conference finals. So if teams can be smart building around their really good players and adding good solid quality role players then I still think there is a world where super teams can win championships but on the flip side we're seeing a lot of these smaller market teams who have built through the draft winning championships the raptors built through the draft they made their one big move to acquire Kawhi Leonard they won the finals the bucks they built through the draft they took chances on unheralded players like Chris Middleton and it paid off and then look at the nuggets pretty much all of their best players they drafted jokic was their pick murray was their pick like a border junior was their pick and they've added good role players like Aaron Gordon, KCP, Bruce Brown. So I think both building through the draft and building through super teams are viable ways to win championships and I think because of that that adds a lot of parity to the league. There's multiple ways you can build your team to win a championship as a big or small market. It is possible. So I think having that parity in the NBA is really good. So while I don't think the super team era is truly dead i think seeing you know teams build through the draft golden state as well most of their core comes from the draft and they won four championships with curry and clay and draymond and all those guys so you can still build in the draft in this league and win championships but you got to hit on your picks and in the nba it is a little bit of the crap shoot it's not easy to hit on your picks five out of every 10 top 10 picks every year don't normally turn into quality role players and then you only have one or two guys who end up being really good players most years. So, while it is a challenge, if you can hit on your picks, it's possible. Yeah, uh I was the one that brought up this question and I wanted to bring it up for four reasons. The Nuggets, the Heat, the Celtics, and the Lakers. All four teams made, the, made their respective conference finals. All four teams have two elite star players. Nuggets have their two, Heat have Jimmy and Bam, Celtics, Tatum and Brown, Lakers, LeBron, AD. All four of them made their finals. They have their two stars and they have good to elite role players. And that is where I'm thinking the direction of the league may be going. Of course, you're going to have teams want to go still go get super teams. The Lakers have money. They might want to go get Kyrie, maybe James Harden, maybe Kyrie wants to recruit LeBron to go to Dallas. I doubt they have the money, but it's an idea. Like you said, the Suns might want to go get someone else, and it's going to be a question of can they? Because if you have those three guys, it's going to be hard to keep them stable. Look at the Nets these past three years; they had barely any games with their big three, and now all three of them are gone. You have the Suns; they got KD, and they got bounced in the second round. You and you can look at the Bucks; they don't have any superstar big three. Well, you got Giannis, Chris Middleton, and what Drew Holiday is their third guy. They have a really nice roster, and they end up winning the finals. You have the Raptors; they went out, they got their one big star, they got their really good, nice players. Finals, easy win. You can look at the Sixers; they tried. You have Embiid and Harden; they're your big two. They just didn't have enough good role players to build around, 
and beaten Harden. He has Tyrese Maxey, PJ Tucker is solid, but not enough. The the way I'm seeing it is you get your two star players to build around, and if you get good to elite role players who can fill out and still be productive while they're if they're hurt or if they're sitting because they're tired or something, you're still going to be able to win games. That's how I'm seeing it. I think the biggest three teams that are going to be a testament to this is to see what the Lakers do and if they get a star or if they just build around LeBron and AD, the Thunder, and if they get one star, two stars, or they try and get just the one star and build around SGA, the new star, and keep the role players. And what the Blazers do, do they keep Dame? Do they build another star with Dame? That's going to be the big testament to see if this big three era is alive. It's going to be a big question. I do think teams can do the super team type of stuff, but it's going to be difficult. But I do think this big two-star elite role player era, I think it's starting to perform. You see the Nuggets, you see the Heat, you see the Celtics. They're going for it. They know what they're doing. The NBA draft is a little bit over a week away. Obviously, a lot of the attention has been on Victor Wembanyama. He's going to go number one to the Spurs. But we don't need to talk about that. We already know what Victor is. We already know he's going to the Spurs. So there are some other interesting storylines, particularly the second and third picks, which are really the pivot points in this year's draft. We'll start with Charlotte at two. The question is, do they go with Scoot Henderson or do they go with Brandon Miller? Scoot Henderson's the better prospect in a lot of people's opinion, mine as well, while Brandon Miller might be the better fit. Maybe Charlotte's looking to get their own version of Jason Tatum. That could be the upside that a guy like Brandon Miller brings to the table, and he might be a better pure fit with LaMelo Ball. If you draft Scoot Henderson, maybe you try to pair up LaMelo and Scoot. Maybe LaMelo eventually gets traded. I'm not convinced he really wants to stick around in Charlotte for that long. I would pick Scoot Henderson. I think picking Brandon Miller would be a total mistake. In the NBA, you do not draft for fit. You draft the best player available. There are some recent examples of teams who have picked for fit in the top three, and it has backfired. In 2020, the Warriors could have picked LaMelo Ball. They ended up with James Wiseman because he was a quote-unquote better fit. Wiseman was traded within two and a half seasons. He gave them no impact, and they got second round picks in exchange for him. Would a good version of James Wiseman be a better fit than LaMelo? Yes, but I'm sure they would rather the asset of LaMelo right now than James Wiseman, who turned into nothing. Two years ago, 2018, the Sacramento Kings had the second overall pick. A lot of people, myself included, thought Luka Doncic was the best prospect on the board. They had drafted their ball-dominant guard the prior year with De'Aaron Fox, so they decided to pair him up with Marvin Bagley. Bagley was eventually traded before his rookie contract ended for pretty much nothing, and Luka Doncic is practically an MVP-level player. So you have teams like the Kings and the Warriors who have drafted basically busts over all-star plus level players, and there are other examples of this going back into the past as well. So I don't think the Warriors should draft for fit. Am I saying Brandon Miller is going to turn into Marvin Bagley? No, I'm not. But... I think you got to go with the best player available, and that's Scoot Henderson. Then that brings us to the Blazers at three. We know which player is going to be the pick there. It's going to be whichever one of Scoot or Brandon Miller does not go to the Hornets. The real question is, though, who will be making the third pick? Because there are a lot of rumors that suggest the Blazers are looking to move out of this selection and go and get a star. They want to build around Dame, and there are a lot of really good options for them. Jalen Brown could be in play. I don't think the Boston Celtics will want to trade him, but I think that would be best case scenario for the Blazers. A name that I've seen a lot is Carl Anthony Towns. I think this would be a mistake for Portland. I don't think Cat is worth the third overall pick. Bradley Beal's name has been floated in trade rumors now. I think trading really any high draft pick for him would be absolutely moronic, but the Blazers are desperate. Another option, maybe you don't trade the third pick for a guy like OG Ananobi, but he's someone who could be in play for a team like the Blazers. Mikael Bridges could always be in play, although I doubt the Nets really want to do that. So I'm not sure if the Blazers can really get great value here. If they don't, I don't think they should force a trade and just pick whichever of Scoot or Brandon Miller, if I had to guess, probably Brandon Miller, who would be on the board for them. You'll have an asset in Brandon Miller on your team who you can eventually trade down the line if you still want to get that star. And if not, you can just keep him and build around him, assuming he's a good player. 
So I'm very curious to see what the Blazers do there at number three. And then after that, you get to that next tier of prospects like Amin Thompson, Jarris Walker, Cam Whitmore, Asar Thompson, Taylor Hendricks. It'll be interesting to see what Houston and Detroit do at four and five, which will really lay out the rest of the draft. I think Houston probably goes Amen Thompson. And then the Pistons at five have a number of different ways they could go. Maybe they go with Walker. Maybe they go with Whitmore. I kind of get the gut feeling they might really like Taylor Hendricks. I think that would be a pretty good pick for them. And then after that, you get to that next tier of guys like Anthony Black, Cason Wallace, um, some other good players, Grady Dick, of course, go Jayhawks. And who knows, maybe we'll see some surprise lottery picks. Maybe a team like OKC takes a shot on upside with a guy like Derek Lively, Gigi Jackson, or even Bilal Koulibaly. So it'll be an interesting draft. Obviously, two and three are the big picks to watch, but I think there are some other interesting storylines with these prospects down the board. Yeah, I'm not going to go too much into this. I don't know NBA that much, and I, let alone the draft. But what I do know is you don't draft forfeit, you draft who's best available. I'm sure the Hornets can figure out, assuming they take Scoot, that you can combine Scoot and LaMelo and have them both on the court. And if anything, if Scoot ends up being better than LaMelo, trade LaMelo. Do what you need. Make it work, whether it's both of them or just one. Just don't take Brandon Miller. It's not that he's bad, but Scoot is a better prospect. I think almost everyone can agree with that. And the Blazers, I think it's either... One of three things. Either you draft Brandon Miller, assumingly. Either you go and trade for a guy like Jalen Brown. Or you can trade Dame. That's another option. You have Anthony Simons. You have Shaden Sharp, who looks like a potential future MVP candidate. He looks like he's ridiculous. And then you get a guy, Brandon Miller, and assumingly he's good. That's three really good players. And if you want to trade Dame to go play as a Laker, a Celtic, a Mav, wherever he wants to go... You can let him go win his ring, hopefully, and you can get picks to go build this roster around Simons, around Sharp, around Brandon Miller, and you can become a, still a good team, but be a lot younger. And Dame, obviously, probably, maybe the best player in your franchise, but it's sometimes it's time to go. His loyalty is probably better than none, but sometimes you got to know when to kind of cut the ties it might be time for Dame. I think they're going to try and get a co-star for Dame. But I think if, it's, if they can't get a guy like Jalen Brown, I don't think they should go out and force anything else. I don't think you should get Cat. Maybe you'd go take Joel and beat. I don't know if you have the ammo for that. I don't know if they want to trade a guy like Shannon Sharp to go get Joel and beat. I don't know if they want to be able to pull that, sh pull that trigger yet. But it, it's going to be a big question mark to see what they do. Do they stay at pick three? Does Scoot fall to them, maybe? Do the Hornets decide to go and take Brandon Miller? Do they do they get a guy like Scoot to pair with Dame? Do they go get a co-star? Does Dame have to wear a different color? It's going to be so weird seeing him in not red or black. But it's going to be a lot. And I wish I could answer them, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I know the Blazers are definitely hoping that Scoot falls to them at three because either they get the better prospect or that pick becomes a little bit more valuable, assuming the rest of the league holds Scoot in a higher regard to Brandon Miller. So I'm excited to see how it turns out next Thursday. And with that, we're going to go to our fun and game segment at the end, and we will reveal whatever Nick and Nader's surprises, which I don't know at this moment. So now we have made it to the fun and game segment here at the end of the episode. Nick and Ader told me off camera, what the, what the hell? <laughs> he told me off camera uh, what the plan is. So if you want to explain to everybody what we are going to be doing, uh, you can do that. Yeah, so uh, as of recording this within the past week, uh, Octi has hit 20,000 subscribers on his main channel on Octi on Gaming. And I thought to do a, as a little celebration was to do a little bit of a Q&A about him, his channel, and kind of what he's been doing the past couple of years and just figured I'd throw it out here on here because I don't he has no idea what he's planning for 20k and I thought a little idea here I figured it'd be nice and sweet for him all right I'm uh I'm ready when you are all right so I will start off a little bigger number one what does it mean to be able to hit 20,000 subscribers uh 20k is certainly a big number when when I started off when I was in like seventh grade I never knew I was going to hit this. Obviously, you know, I had big goals. I wanted to be big, but 
20K seemed like a major aspiration, and here we are. So it's certainly pretty cool to continue to hit these big milestones, but on the flip side, it just means that we're closer to these even bigger numbers and it's in reach. And it sort of symbolizes that we can go out and potentially get these bigger subscriber review numbers down the line. So while it is cool, it also kind of signals that I gotta continue to work even harder on my craft to get even better at it. So the next one I got for you is how did you first get into YouTube and what made you start the channel? So uh, a few months before I started, a friend and I had like kind of talked about the idea of like starting channels. And right as soon as we had that conversation, it was like a light bulb kind of went off in my head. And I thought that would be like the coolest thing ever. So I did some research that summer. And then that September around my birthday, I started my channel. And here we are nearly seven years later. Uh, so then this one kind of goes into that. Uh, what made you want to start making YouTube on doing like Madden, LB The Show, 2K and all that? Well, I had been playing all those games prior to when I started doing YouTube. And obviously franchise was my favorite game mode before I went to YouTube. So I figured, you know, it would be cool to do that style of content. I had watched a ton of franchise YouTubers in the past. And I thought what they did was really cool. And I thought it would be cool to do something similar. And as time has gone on, I've been able to do that while also putting in my own like personal twists and whatnot. All right. So then how would did you become a fan of the crippling sadness that is Detroit sports? Okay. This is, this is a fun story. So I could not have been older than six or seven. I was in like kindergarten or first grade or something. And my dad had like these magnets of every NFL team's helmet. And the Lions one was my favorite one. My favorite color is blue. I thought the lion was cool. And the rest is history. I eventually hopped on the bandwagon for the other Detroit sports. I wasn't originally a Tigers fan. I was originally a Chicago Cubs fan. And I liked a bunch of different teams when I was young. I liked the Dodgers. I liked the Giants. I like a bunch of teams. But then right when the Tigers were getting really good, like 2012 with Prime Miggy and Prince Fielder, who had been one of my favorite players, I became a Tigers fan. And then from there, I really started to like the team and then I figured I might as well hop on the bandwagon for the Pistons as well so I kind of went over three there considering none of those teams have been good at all during my childhood but I'd like to think the Lions are turning it around and maybe the Pistons can too not so sure about the Tigers though so is, is that kind of also how you got into Kansas there's, there's blue and you just to hop on the train yeah so with kansas i might have saw like some college basketball top 25 ranking and me being like seven or eight years old i probably thought there were only 25 teams to pick from and kansas i thought was the coolest one so i went with kansas and then for oregon football again i was not originally an oregon football fan my team was originally lsu and this is when they would have played alabama in the championship like 10 or 12 years ago with justin jefferson's brother as the uh, as the quarterback and then eventually I hopped on the Oregon bandwagon like every other 10 year old at the time. I thought their uniforms were really cool. Marcus Mariota, DeAnthony Thomas, those were my guys. And I, I've stuck with Oregon. So by choosing these teams over LSU football, the Cubs and Philly sports, I have lost out on the possibility of getting many championships, but at least Kansas got one last year. Uh, and then we'll, we'll start going more into the channel itself. Uh, what series do you remember most fondly? I would say I have two here. The first one would probably be the Westlake Dynasty. That one lasted over three years of real time and nearly 300 episodes. If I've learned one thing about YouTube from that series, it's that I should not have series last three years and 300 episodes, but that series was always a ton of fun. I loved the idea of creating my own school and having my own storylines and building up from the ground. And then the other one I would say is probably the Sonic series. I think that's the one that really helped take my channel off. That series kind of blew up and it helped gain a lot of popularity within my channel. And a lot of the people who were there for that series still really enjoy the Knicks series along with the other stuff that I've been doing. So then you got a football and a, a basketball one. Do you have a, a favorite MLB The Show series at all? Uh, I would say of all time, probably the Orioles series. Louis St. John, I think is my favorite player ever on the channel partly because he's the best one, but he, he was awesome. And I would say probably that was my favorite MLB series of all time so far. Yeah, I asked that because I'm going to piggyback right off of that. Uh, besides Lewis St. John, do you have any players that you think would be the top of that list that you remember fondly of? 
Uh, I would say the next best player after St. John would be Odavius Shepard with the Cavs series. He was the number one option. We drafted him second overall, I think, in the second draft of the series. And he, he was really good immediately. We've had some other guys who have been total record breakers. Tykeem Keon, the wide receiver from the Eagles series last year, is a good example of that. Buzz and Oscar with the Sonics, they were both awesome as well. And I'm excited to see what the new guys can do. Maybe Woody Landry tries to beat some of Louis St. John's marks. That's a lot easier said than done. I doubt he will, but you never know. I mean, he's 19, probably going to be starting. He might be the next teenager all-star bid since Bryce Harper. That'd be pretty cool. Although, did Louis St. John make it as a rookie? I think he did. So um, It's Louis St. John. He probably did. He probably did, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then are there any other YouTubers that you would look up to and model what you do after? Uh, there's definitely a few of them. The first one I really modeled my stuff after was Arios. He hasn't really done sports gaming in like five or six years. And he deleted his main channel, which kind of sucks because I still think having some of those old videos available would be kind of helpful. But he was the guy I originally kind of modeled my stuff after. And as I've gone on a little bit farther... I would say a guy who I've really modeled my game after is Mr. Hurricane. I think in terms of franchise content, he's the best in the business. He's been doing it for so long, and he's been so consistent, and he's been so good for over a decade at this point. So I would say uh, him and Arios are the big two for me. Uh, and then in the past year or so, you've added a bunch of projects. You have NCAA Next Up. You have the podcast that we're doing right now. Uh, do you have any future plans in the past few years? Are you trying to figure anything out? What, what do you got there in the, the old chamber? I would say the next thing I really want to do is to find other ways of making content. And I think the biggest ways to do that would be with YouTube Shorts and TikTok. I haven't really been able to get consistent with that. But over the next few months, I really want to because I think that's the next thing that can kind of help catapult my channel into the next realm along with obviously the regular video content i think doing stuff with that could really help me out yeah i know under the hood youtube uh loves their youtube shorts they like to get blown up and i know as a as a just a person i like to get stuck in there for a good hour just scrolling to random young sheldon clips <laughs> so i'm sure you find any like funny clips from main channel stupid clips even here on the podcast or mm -hmm. OFL you could pr definitely throw some of those on there yeah I definitely want to really be focused more on that over the summer so that's that's the plan uh, so then even picking back and off of uh, NCAA uh, this this past season was is going to the last one that's gonna be linked up with the Titans do you have any plans to continue that for the next Madden cycle with the new NCAA game getting pushed back and are you just gonna hold off on it until that game comes out next year? What, what are we doing here? I haven't really decided yet. I, I'm not gonna have as much time next year as I did this year to do a whole NCAA Next Up series because that took all those episodes take really long to make and it worked this year because I had a lot of time, but next year I don't really think I will. So I'm not sure that doing Next Up the way I did it this year is plausible i do want to do something with it even if it's like smaller i still want to be able to tell the stories of a lot of these prospects before they enter the league but it would probably be in a slightly different format which i have not figured out yet but i do have two plus months to figure that out yeah i'm, I'm sure you've always got time and even if it lasts for just the one year hopefully that new ncaa game will come out next year they don't keep pushing it back and we can have a new game for you to, to use up on there yeah ea get it right uh and then talking about series would you ever add a new series for a different sport um or maybe even have two different series for the one sport kind of similar to what you have going on right now with your knicks and the timberwolves uh it's certainly an idea i'd be open to in the future if i were to do a different sport i think the the problem with that at least for now is that the sports that I follow closely are football, basketball, and baseball. Those are the three that I know a lot about and I feel educated with and I feel confident talking about consistently. And there isn't really another sport where I'm like that for now. If there were to be a fourth sport one day, I think it would be hockey. I thought hockey is always kind of a cool sport, but I don't really follow it super closely. So I feel like I would need to do that before starting a whole series on it because, I mean, I don't understand how hockey teams are built and whatnot. But I've always thought hockey was pretty cool. And then two series in one game, certainly possible. I have I think the Knicks and the Timberwolves thing has been a fun experiment so far. I've enjoyed being able to use Minnesota. 
I'm not entirely sure what like a second series in a game would look like, but I'm certainly open to changing things up every once in a while, so I wouldn't rule it out. Yeah, I know. At least for me, I've enjoyed uh, watching Coco be Himothy for the Timberwolves. Should have made an all-star game, but 2K sucks. Common 2K disaster class. <laughs> Uh, and then going a little back to the channel itself, uh, how far do you think you'd be able to go in terms of getting subscribers? Do you think you can hit those big marks like 100K or even a million? To answer truthfully, I don't really know because, I mean, I don't really know what the ceiling is for my style of content. And I would like to think that I can continue to work hard and break the ceiling, especially by continuing to add new forms of content, like again, this summer with taking more advantage of like shorts and whatnot. But I don't really know what the ceiling is. So I would like to say I can hit those big numbers, but I'm not sure. Time will really tell. All I can really do is work hard and continue to try to evolve and get better and hope that the numbers continue to grow. And the second last question I have for you is, have you ever thought about doing some sort of merch, maybe like baseball caps or like a mock jersey or something like that? I have wanted to do merch for a little while. I don't really know exactly how to go about doing it, but it is something I would like to do in the future for sure. If you try to sell me a Louis St. John Orioles jersey, I would buy that immediately. I'm 100%. Tykeem Keon Eagles jersey, absolutely. I have a, uh, a Louis St. John like custom Orioles jersey in my uh, MLB.com cart for $150. I can't, I don't think I'm allowed to make like fake like jerseys with team names because I think it's like copyrighted and stuff, but I'm not sure if there's another way I'd be able to do something like that. Cause again, I don't think I can like buy or sell stuff that have like the team name on them, but you never know. I could always try to get creative. And instead of writing Orioles, you just write Octagon on Damien and just put it in like the team color. Yeah, that, something like yeah. that could always work. That's not like copyrighted. Yeah, I, if you showed me a jersey that said Louis St. John on it for $150, I, I'm buying it. Like, <laughs> I don't I don't care. <laughs> uh, and then the last one I have is just, is there anything else that you would like to say? Any words uh, for your now 20,000 subscribers and counting? Uh, I appreciate everybody for being a part of the path so far, whether you've been here for years or if you're new, your support is always appreciated. And just know this is this is just the start. I'm gonna work even harder now. I'm gonna try to get even better at this. And I'm excited to see where the future can take it. Well, I know that's all I got for you. I am always gonna be excited to see what you have planned for the future. I know I have done my part to at least try to help you in your growth. I'm here with you on the podcast. I've given you, I, I've tried at least to give you ideas for other stuff, but I know I will try and sit there in your little little corner and help you out. Well, uh, I, I appreciate it. So that's going to pretty much wrap up the episode. I hope you guys enjoyed the AFC West preview, talking about the MLB season and the NBA season wrapped up. And I hope you guys enjoyed the little Q&A segment as well. I think that went well. I think that was a really good idea to add on here at the end. And uh, who knows what I'm going to do for 20K on the main channel. I still haven't really decided yet. I want to think of something good, but I'm not entirely sure what that is yet. So if you've got any final words before we want to wrap it up here. Not much. Just here's another 20K. Here's another 20K. Hopefully it can come sooner rather than later. So make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel if you're new. Next episode's going to be a couple weeks. I do want to have some NBA draft-related videos up pretty soon since the draft is like eight days away. So I should probably get on that. But uh, yeah, peace out.